Um, but we're going to go ahead and start. So for um, number one, let me write this down. 13, 14, and we're doing the final review. Now your final review is in my math lab, just like the one that I've clicked on. Um, and you should have the same exact type of questions for one through 44. However, the, the numbers or the functions are algorithmically generated, which means your number one might not be 5y squared minus 22y plus 17 equal to zero. It might have different numbers, um, but it's still the same concept. So we're still gonna use this as an example to cover the concept. I do also wanna point out one important fact about the final exam. Um, all of our tests, I have allowed you to have open notes, um, but for the final exam, the department has set a standard for the department final exam. So you cannot have open notes. What you can have is a regular sheet of paper, eight and a half by 11 inches, um, and you can write on it front and back, and you can put whatever you think you need to take that final exam on that piece of paper. I have had students get really clever and write out all of their notes, and then they take pictures of it, I guess, in camp center, or I don't know how. Um, and then eventually somehow they shrink it. And so they end up fitting like four pages on one sheet of paper and then on the back, another four. I mean, I've seen people get really, really <laughs> extra with it, um, but whatever you need, okay? Just make sure that everything that you feel like you're gonna need is on that one sheet of paper, okay? It can be on the front and the back. So no open notes. So we cannot have, you know, all of our binders and all of our notes everywhere in the videos. Because watch the videos. Um, if that does happen, unfortunately, I have to give you a zero on the final exam. So again, those are not my rules. Those are the security rules for the school. Um, and it's basically to make everything fair for everyone. Because we don't want like one instructor to allow notes, the other instructor to allow nothing. And, you know, but those same two students taking the same class are not on the same level because one gets all the resources and the other doesn't. So they make it a standard resource and that's one page of notes, okay? So it's a little bit different than the previous ones. Um, I always encouraged you guys to have one page of notes just because it's for easy, quick reference than shuffling through a bunch of papers. Um, but for the final exam, we don't have a choice. It's not optional. You just get one sheet and that's it, okay? So I have to make sure I point that out so that no one gets a zero on the final exam because they didn't know about that fact, okay? Um, and I'll also post it when I create the final exam because I have to copy it from the department. When I create it, I'll put you know some reminders in there about the note sheet, okay? So just be mindful of that key component. No open notes, just one sheet of paper, front and back, whatever you wanna put, okay? Now for number one, it says solve by factoring. Now, I'll be honest with you, I grade the final exam a little bit differently than I graded the regular test. I grade the regular test like very thoroughly. Um, the final exam one, I'm a little bit more lenient um, I only really grade the problems that are got that are marked wrong. Okay. So if you got a problem marked wrong, then I'll go in there and I'll try to figure out, um, you know, where the error happened. Maybe you earned most of the points for that problem. You just made like a sign error or something. And so then I can give you some extra, um, points on that. So for the final, you'll never see your grade go down. I know with the regular test that was happening because you got one point for answering the correct answer and then all the other points came from your work. So if you answered all the questions correct and got 100, but yet you showed no paper, no paperwork, um, that 100 turned to a 10 like real fast, right? So <laughs> it's different on the final exam. The final exam, I only grade the ones that are wrong, the ones that are right stay with all the points, okay? So it's just a little bit, a little bit different. Um, so, if I were doing this on the final, they wouldn't know whether or not I did it by factoring. And as long as I get the problem right, the instructor wouldn't even know whether or not I did it by factoring, okay? So essentially, as long as you're solving this equation, you should 
be able to be fine, okay? I'm gonna show you how to do it factoring, and then I'm gonna show you quadratic formula because that's always the fast way to solve a quadratic, okay? Um, and we should get the same answer. So factoring is a little bit harder when there's a number in front. We have to do five times the 17 to figure out what number we're factoring. So five times 17 is 85. And then I would find all the factors of 85, right? So let's see, the square root of 85 is about nine. So I would not be going any further than nine in this um, slew of numbers. So I know that one times 85 is 85. 85 is not an even number. So two times nothing would, you know, it, it had to be a decimal in order to give me 85. Um, same thing you could do in a calculator, 85 divided by two. If that's a decimal, you can't use it. 85 divided by three is also a decimal. And I'm just gonna keep going down the line. That's not a decimal. 85 divided by seven, 85 divided by eight. Nope, still getting decimals. And then nine is still a decimal. So you really just have two pairs. So which one of those two pairs is gonna add to give you 22? Probably not that one, right? It would probably have to be these two. But I want them to add to give me a negative 22, which means they probably will both have to be negative. So it'll be a negative 5y and a negative 17y, and that together would give me negative 22y. But from here, whenever we have four terms and we're factoring, right, we have to um, group it. So we cut it off here. And then we say, what does this group have in common? They have a 5 and a y in common. And so 5y times what? We're going to be 5y squared. I'll need an extra y. Minus 5y times what will give me 5y. 5y times 1, right? So you have to make sure that when you distribute this, you get those two. That's how you know you factored it correctly. We must bring down our sign here. If it's a plus, it has to be a plus. <coughs> Excuse me. What do these two guys have in common? They have 17. But notice that what you're factoring out is a negative 17 because we brought down that minus. I'm sorry, I have to drink something. Um, so then negative 17 times y will give me negative 17y. And negative 17 times a negative one will give me positive 17. I don't know if I inhaled a piece of dirt or what. Oh my goodness. Okay, sorry. So then now we have to figure out what the two sides have in common. And they seem to have this y minus one in common. So if I'm taking the y minus one and factoring it out, <coughs> excuse me, all I should be left with is 5y minus 17. And if you were to FOIL this all out <coughs> and combine the like terms, it should be what you originally started with, okay? So you can always do that to check to make sure that you factored it correctly. Um, I won't just because it's going to take a little bit of time and have 44 problems I need to cover in, what, three hours? So we're going to keep going. Once it's factored, you apply what they call the zero factor property, which basically says if you have two things multiplied together equal to zero, one of them has to equal zero or the other one has to equal zero. So that means that this factor would have to equal zero or this factor would have to equal zero. And if I have each of those here, I get y equal to one. Here I get five y equal to positive 17 and then y equal to 17 over five.
And so I have two answers. And it asked me for a solution set. So it's essentially just those numbers in a um, braces. And it does say type in an integer or simplified fraction and use cut as needed. So we could try it in there. One comma 17 over five. Okay, moving on, we now have um, number two. So I'm gonna push this up a little bit. So for number two, we have three X minus four squared equal to 39, <clears throat> excuse me. This one though says use the square root property. So I'm gonna write the square root property. Um, square root property says that if I have X squared or anything squared equal to something else, I can get X by itself by taking the square root of both sides. But when I do that, I get plus or minus the square root. So for number two, I could take the square root of both sides here and it will make the square go away on the three X minus four, like it did with the X. But on the right-hand side, I should have plus or minus square root of 39. And I do not think that the square root of 39 is a nice, it is not, it just stays square root of 39. So it stays like that, but I still have to solve for X. So it's probably why all these answers look funny. Um, but first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add the four. And I can't really add these because one is a house and one is not in the house. So we're just gonna put the positive four in front of the plus or minus. And then to continue solving for X, we have to divide by three. So then we get X equal to four plus or minus the square root of 39 over three. And it looks like that matches letter C. Um, B is with just the minus, D is with just the plus, but we have both, right? Plus and minus. So it should be C. So it's taking us way back to all those different um, techniques, okay? Let me do number three now. So I'm gonna have to scoot this one over. And I will post all these notes. So if you need to look back at them, you can watch the recording or you can just look at the notes. And if you do have questions at any time, just chime in and ask, okay? So this one says specifically solve using the quadratic formula. So then we know the number in front here is A, which is one. B is the number in front of X or R, which is a positive three. And then C is your constant, which happens to be a negative one. And so here's the quadratic formula. It's if, we have this, and it doesn't have to be X, it could be R, then X would equal all of this, okay? So that is our quadratic formula. So we're gonna apply that. Now I don't have X as my variable, I have R, so it would be R equal to all of this. So negative B plus or minus B squared minus four AC all over two times A. So I get nine plus four, which is 13 over two. Um, and I don't think you can simplify that. The square root of 13 is stays as square root of 13. And you cannot divide, you know, each one by two. It's not going to change anything. That should be the solution set. Actually, it wants you to separate them with commas, right? Yep. So that means we're going to have negative three plus 
square root of 13 over 2, and then negative 3 minus the square root of 13 over 2. Um, so let's try that. Negative 13 plus square root. Oh no, anything doesn't do it. I guess I have to use that. 13 over two. Comma fraction negative 13 minus the square root of 13. Oh, I pressed it two times. over two, does that look? Oh, why do I have 13 in the front? It's three. I'll show my paper. See, I have negative three in the front and then the plus square root of 13 over two. So that should be good. There we go. Oh, this one's good. Number four, I have six X over x minus six equal to nine plus seven x squared over x minus six. So here you have to take your denominators <clears throat> and multiply every single term by the common denominator. Since these have the same denominator and this one does not have one at all, we can use x minus six as the common denominator since they're the same, okay? If these were different, then you would have to use both of them as the common denominator. But for now, we're safe with just using x minus six. So we're gonna multiply this term by x minus six. We're gonna multiply the not times x minus six. And we're even gonna multiply this other fraction times x minus six. And so what happens is that this factor cancels with that factor. This whole factor cancels with that whole factor. And then all you're left with here is six x. Here you can actually distribute. So you get nine x minus, I believe 54. Yep, 54. And those are gone. So you just have 7x squared. And so then you look and see is this a linear equation or is it a quadratic equation? And because I have an x squared, it's a quadratic. So I do need to get the 6x over to the other side and put them in the correct order and probably use quadratic forms because that's the easiest way to solve a quadratic equation. The square root property and factoring are not the easiest, um, especially when it's not in that form with like something squared equal to a number. So let's take this and subtract 6x. This is the like term. So I'm going to put it underneath that guy. Now this is gone, and I only have 3x. But I definitely want to have this in order so that I can apply my quadratic formula, right? We want them in order, and then we can apply the quadratic formula. So positive seven X squared goes first, positive three X goes next, and then the negative 54 constant. So then here, A is equal to seven, B is equal to three, and C is equal to negative 54. So we get X equals negative B plus or minus, b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So let's see, that's 9 minus 4 times 7 times negative 54. That's 1, 5, 2, 1 over 14. Now I don't know about that radical. Let me see. Square root of 1, 5, 2, 1. Oh, wow, it's a nice number. I put it in the calculator and it's 39. I was not expecting it to be a nice number. I thought it was gonna be something weird. Instead of three plus or minus 39 over 14. Well, that we can simplify, right? So we can first split it 
and do negative three plus 39 over 14, and then negative three minus 39 over 14. So let's see, negative three plus 39 is 36 divided by 14 in a fraction form is 18 over seven. Negative three minus 39 is negative 42 divided by 14 is negative three. Now, as long as these answers don't make any of the denominators zero, then they are answers. So if I would have gotten x equal to six as an answer, I can't plug in x equal to six because six minus six would be zero, okay? So if, if I had done all this math and I got x equal to six as one of my answers, it would not have been an answer at all. Those are what they called, remember, extraneous solutions, extra solutions that are not true, okay? So I didn't get a six, so it's okay, right? Both of these are gonna be good. But you definitely wanna make sure you have that moment where you ask yourself, do any of these make the denominator zero? Because if they do, they are not part of the answers, okay? Here, they, they're both good. Neither one of these is gonna make this denominator zero or that denominator zero. So my, uh, do they want solution sets? What did they want here? Yep, they wanted solution set. So my solution set would just be those two guys in the braces. So I'll go here and do 18, oops, 18, oh my goodness, 18 over seven, comma, negative three. Okay, so this was a different type of equation. Um, so we'll go ahead and try this little radical equation. I know it's going way back, so sorry. But at least you'll have examples to try to help jog back your memory. So for number five, we have x minus the square root of 24 minus 2x. And the steps with radicals is you have to get a radical by itself. And then you get rid of the house by squaring both sides, okay? And then you solve whatever you got. So for here, I want to make sure that my radical is on one side by itself and my number is on one side by itself. Now I can take two steps. I can move the X over and then divide by a negative invisible one to get this house by itself. Or I could just add the house over and it'll be by itself, okay? I feel like that's faster. So I'm just gonna add the radical on both sides. So then here I just have X all by itself and zero plus the house is just gonna be the house. And then from here, I can get rid of the house by squaring both sides of your equation. So x squared is just x squared. The house squared means the house goes away. And then we see what kind of equation we have. Is it linear or is it quadratic? And because it's x squared, it's actually quadratic. So we wanna do the same thing as before. Move everybody over to that side. So this will become x squared. When that moves, it'll become positive two x. And when the constant moves over, it'll become negative 24. Now, this is pretty easy to factor. So if you'd like solving um, quadratics by factoring, you could do it. And you would get your, um, I think you would get negative six and positive four as your final answers. But we'll do a quadratic formula and you'll see you'll get the same negative six and positive four as your answers. So we're going to do A equal to 1, B equal to 2, and C equal to negative 24. So we have X equals negative B plus or minus B squared minus 4 times A times C, all over 2 times A. So that's 4 
minus four times one times a negative 24, I get 100. And the square root of 100 is just 10. So notice when you take the square root of 100, it's just 10. No house on 10. I've seen a couple of people doing that. They keep the house on there even though they already took the square root. Okay. So be careful with that. And we'll do negative 2 plus 10 over 2 and negative 2 minus 10. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Okay, so that will be eight divided by two, which is four. That will be negative divided by two, which is negative six. So there's those two answers I was talking about. Now, with radicals though, you wanna make sure that when you go back to plug it in, that they actually work because Sometimes with the radicals, the problems just don't check out and you get those um, extraneous solutions again. So I'm going to check it in the original equation. So x is 4. I'm going to say x, which is 4, minus the square root of 24 minus 2 times x, which is 4, equals 0. So let's see if that's true. 4 minus the square root of 24 minus 2 times 4, it is equal to 0. So this one checks out. Now we try negative 6. So x is negative 6 minus the square root of 24 minus 2 times negative 6. Does that equal 0? Oops, negative 6. No, this one does not equal zero. We got negative 12 instead of zero. So I only have one answer then. Negative six is what's called an extraneous solution, okay? So this guy is called an extraneous solution. It's just an extra answer that you found when doing all of the algebra, but it's not actually an answer, okay? So in my solution set, I'm only gonna have the one answer that checked out, and that's the four. So here, we're just gonna type in the four. So here's another one. Oh, I changed, I clicked on it twice and it changed the numbers, how weird. Um, so for number seven, or no, number six, this one's because it already has the radical all by itself. So we have square root of seven X plus 42 equal to three X plus four. Since the house is already alone, we can get rid of it right away by squaring both sides. Now the square gets rid of the house over here, but on this side, you actually have to multiply it three X plus four times itself, right? That's the definition of what a square means. It means this guy times himself, okay? So I do have to foil it out. Do not square three X and square four. You, there's no rule that says you can do that. The only time you can do that is if the two things are multiplied, then you can give each person that exponent. But if you have plus or minus, that does not equal them individually. It's not the same thing, okay? Um, so don't try to distribute the exponent when there's a plus or the minus in between, okay? Write it out twice and foil it out. So those are going to be 9x squared. That's 12x. This together is 12x. And 4 times 4 is 16. Now, if I look at this, it is a quadratic. So I am going to need to get everybody over to that side with the x squared. 
So I'm going to have the minus 7x and minus 42. And it doesn't matter which one you put it under because they're all going to have to go together anyway. But the constants should be um, vertically aligned. So here that's gone, that's gone. So I have a zero. I have 9x squared. And let's see, positive 12 plus 12, take away 7, is a positive 17. So that's how many x's I have. And then 16 take away 42 is negative 26. So if I want to solve this quadratic, I'm definitely going to be doing the quadratic formula. So I get x equals, and a is equal to 9, b is equal to 17, c is equal to negative 26. So we get negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2 times a. So that's negative 17 plus or minus, and then I'm not sure about that, 17 squared minus 4, 9 times negative 26. I get 1, 2, 2, 5 in the calculator, and 2 times 9 is 18. I think that one is actually a nice one. 1, 2, 2, 5, it is. The square root of 1225 is actually 35. But notice there's no house on the 35, right? So we need to just write it without a house. Now it's going to be negative 17 plus 35, and then negative 17 minus 35. So let's see, negative 17 plus 35 divided by 18 is 1, negative 17 minus 35 divided by 18, oops, it's a fraction, negative 26 over 9. And again, this problem did have a house, right? So we have to check both of our answers. So I'm gonna go plug in one first and then I'll do the negative 26 over nine. So it's gonna be the square root of seven times one plus 42, three times one plus four. So square root of seven times one plus 42, I get seven. And then three times one is three plus four is seven. So the one checked out. Now let's go check the negative 26 over nine guy. So let's see, square root seven, negative 26 over nine close the parentheses, plus 42. I get 14 over three. Then three times negative 26 over nine plus four. I get negative 14 over three. Now they're pretty close, but they're not exactly the same thing, okay? So these are not equivalent, which means that the negative 26 over nine is not the answers. So my solution set should only have the one answer that out, which is the one. Be very careful. Don't say seven is the answer, right? That's just the value we got to check it, okay? Where did the sevens come from? It came from x equal one, okay? So be very, very careful. Let's try it out, see if we are correct. Okay, now... Still radicals, but they're asking us something different. So for this one, they're asking us about the domain. So we have y equals the square root of 6x minus 2. If they're asking about the domain of a radical, it's basically where the radicand thing is where the radicand is greater than or equal to 0 because you can only plug in numbers inside the house that are positive or zero, okay? So what is a radicand? It's whatever is inside the radical, okay? So in my case, 
I figure out where 6x minus 2 is greater than or equal to 0. And so you just solve for x. We're going to add 2 on both sides. We get 6x is greater than or equal to 2. We'll divide by 6 on both sides. We get x, e x is greater than or equal to 1 third. Okay. Now, what does that look like in an interval? Um, if I, I like to do it, and then I can put it in an interval. So here's one third. It does have a bar, so it'll have a bracket. And it says x is greater than one third. So it's everybody on this side, but with a bracket because of the bar. Okay. So what does it look like in an interval? It'll be one third, and it goes all the way that way forever. So it'll go toward positive infinity. Okay, um, and then it's asking me about the range. There's only two um, options that have the correct domain. A and B have the correct domain, right? Both of them have a bracket and then one third to infinity. But which one has the correct range? The way you can tell where the range is gonna start is plug in where its value starts, okay? So if I plug in this one third, I'm going to get the square root of six times one third is two. So the square root is zero, which is zero. So that means that the Y value should start at zero, okay? So this is the domain, but this X value gives me this Y value. So it means that the range should be from zero to infinity, okay? So it shouldn't be the B, it should be A. Now for fractions, the way you find the domain is a little bit different, okay? For fractions, we have to remember that our denominators can never be zero, okay? So for here, your dom to find your domain is basically where the denominator does not equal zero, okay? So let's go figure it out. My denominator is two minus X and apparently that cannot equal zero, okay? So if I add X to both sides, I get that two cannot equal a positive X. It can equal everything else, just not positive two. So if I draw that on a number line, here's positive two, and I cannot have positive two. So it's like there's a hole right here, right? Everything else is good, just not the positive two. So I scribble this way and I scribble that way. And what does that look like as a uh, interval? It looks like negative infinity to two. And because it's a whole, it's gonna have a parentheses. And then the other sat, the other half of it is two to positive infinity. Okay. So so far that's going to give me um, either C or D for the domain. Now for the range, we know that we can't plug in two. So we know that when we plug in two, we we're not gonna get a Y value because 12 over zero is undefined, okay? So there's obviously gonna be a Y value that doesn't exist. So there's no way that the range could be from negative infinity to infinity. Because as soon as I try to plug in two, I'm gonna get undefined, okay? So it means my option has to be C. Because if you have an X value removed from the situation, that X value should have corresponded to a Y value, which would also get removed from the situation. Now, number nine is a lot more writing than it is doing. So bear with me, I'm gonna write it down first and then we'll talk about it. But if I were taking this problem on a test, it probably would take me like two seconds to do it. It's just gonna take me a minute or two because I gotta write it down. So for this problem, I kind of warned you guys, but then there were still people doing it when they came to test time. 
There's three functions, but each of these functions are only applicable for certain x values, okay? So only for x values less than, than two, you would use this top function. Only x values between two and eight, would you use the middle function? And then only for x values that are greater than eight, would you use the bottom function? And what I saw and what I mentioned was, is you should not be plugging in this x value into all three and then picking one. You should know which one and only one of those functions you're supposed to be plugging the negative four into, okay? So I normally marked off a lot of points if I saw you plugging in negative four into all three of them, because then you don't understand the concept there, okay? You only plug negative four into the function where it applies, okay? So my x value, this is my x value, that negative four is not greater than eight. So I would not be using this function at all. Negative four is not even between two and eight. Those are all positive numbers. So I would not be using this function at all. But negative four is smaller than two, right? Negative four is less than two. So this is the region where I can apply my function. And I can only apply it to this top function. That's where I'm gonna plug my four in. One minus three times negative four which gives me positive 12, which eventually gives me 13, okay? So be very, very careful on that problem. You need to know which one to plug it into. Don't plug it into all three. I'm telling you right now, if I would have plugged it into here, I would have got negative eight, and negative eight is gonna be one of the answers. If I would have plugged it into here, I would have got what, negative 12 plus two, so negative 10. Negative 10 is gonna be one of the answers. So don't do it in all three because you're likely to pick the wrong one, okay? Only plug it into the one that's supposed to get plugged into. So let's try it there. What did I get? 13. Oh, they want me to keep going. <laughs> There's five parts of it. So now let's do f of two. So f of two. So which one of these three does two live? Now I see a two here and I see a two there. So it could possibly be either the top function or the middle function. However, this one doesn't have an equal bar. This one does. So this top one includes the two, whereas the middle one does not include the two. So I have to put it into the top equation again. So one minus three times two is one minus six, which is negative five. So we'll type that in there. And I think they got about a few more. So F of three, F of three. Now three is not less than two and three is not bigger than eight. So it's definitely in this middle section because three is between two and eight. So I would have to plug three into that middle function. And so I just get six. Now seven, seven is actually in the same situation, right? Isn't seven between two and eight? So I'm gonna plug it into that middle function again, but this time because it's seven, I get 14. And I think this is the last one, f of eight. So again, we see two eights here. One of them has the bar and the other one doesn't. This one does not include the eight. This one has the bar, so it does include the eight. So then I would be plugging in eight into this bottom function. So I get 24 plus two, which is 26. There, now we're moving on to number 10. So this one says graph the following function and it has h of x equal to negative x plus 10 cubed. So this one, we definitely are using transformations. 
So we know that y equal to x cubed by itself looks like this. It's like a curve, like a parabola going that way and then a parabola going downwards. That's what y equals x cubed looks like. But when you put a negative in front, when you do this, it makes it flip over, okay? So now it would look like this. So it will go up on the left side and then down on the right side, right? It's going to make it flip, okay? So we've taken care of this. And then if I'm adding 10 on the inside, that actually makes it do the opposite when it's on the inside. It's actually make it gonna go left 10. So instead of this little center part being at zero, zero, when I try to graph this, it's gonna move to the left 10 units. So now I'm over there at negative 10. and it's up and then down. So it'll go up over here and then down over there. Now, I don't know how they're gonna want, in the computer, on the test, you just circle the one or select the one that's the right answer, but I don't know how they're gonna want me to graph this in there. So maybe this thing, I'm gonna need a parabola. And it says plot. So if I put zero, zero, no, not zero, zero. Oh, let me talk about it some more. Okay. So remember how here it went one over and then one down. And then this one goes one over and one up. So that's one over and one up. So the coordinates of this point are going to be negative 11 and positive one. And then same thing here. If it moves to the right and then down, that's going to be negative nine and negative one. And then we know that the coordinates here are negative 10 and zero. So I have to have those three coordinates on my graph. So let's see. Um, negative 10 and zero. Oh, this is one of those weird ones. You have to put all this stuff in here. So it doesn't have any stretching but it does have shifting and it doesn't shift vertical. A vertical is up and down. It doesn't do that, but it does shift horizontally and it shifts in the negative direction. And it did reflect. And since it reflected upside, it's reflection with uh, respect to Y. And that is looks exactly like what I have on my paper, right? Oh no, it doesn't. Did it reflect it? No, it didn't reflect it. Oh, I pushed the wrong button. It's reflected over X. If it's flipping over, right? That's the X axis I'm flipping over. So my bad, clear. We're just gonna select this, select. I tried to select negative 10, but then it just shifted it over here. So horizontal shift, we wanna make it move left 10 and it should reflect over the X. Now that looks like what I had on my paper. See, it's more narrow because they go all the way up to 20. I didn't go that high, but that should be the one. Let's check it out. Yay. Again, in the computer, you just like this one, you just pick the right one. This one's like what you would see on the final. Okay. That one also is transformations. And I really don't need to write anything because I am going to post this later. I'll go ahead and write it out. But because it has x plus 3, that's actually going to take the original, which is x squared, like that, or square root of x. When you do square root of x plus 3, it's going to make it move to the left three units. So instead of the little starting point being at 0, 0, it's actually gonna be over here at negative three and then go in that direction, okay? So the only one that seems to have gone to the left three is this option here, D. All the other ones did something different, right? A went up, B went to the right, and then C went down. 
D was the only one that shifted it to the left. Okay, number 12. Um, it says the graph to the right, I don't see a graph. Oh, there it is. It says the graph to the right is obtained from the graph of the square root of X and applying several transformations. Describe the transformations and then give the equation of the graph. So this one, I need to do it in the computer. So it looks like the square root, remember the little dot is supposed to start at zero, zero, and then it's supposed to go upward to the right. So it obviously, the little dot's not at zero, zero. It got shifted one, two, three, four units to the left. So I'm gonna select this and say it moved four units to the left. Then it wants to know what type of stretching or shrinking. Um, as long as it's going down a box and over a box, then there's no stretching or shrinking. So no stretching or shrinking. And then did it reflect? It, it did go upside down, right? It's supposed to go upward, but now it looks like it's going downward. So when it flips over like that upside down, it's over the X axis. And then finally, vertical translation. Since that dot is not on the X axis anymore, it actually went up one, two units. So we're gonna select, it went up and put two units. And then now we have to put all of that information together, okay? So it says type an equation. So we're gonna write Y equals, now remember reflecting over the X axis means there's a negative in front of the square root. Um, moving it to the left means I'm going to add, and it moved to the left, what was it, four units? So I'm going to add four. And then the shifting going up and down is on the outside of this. And since it went up to, it's gonna be plus two. So plus for up, minus for down. And with the left and right, it's the opposite of what you think naturally. Plus means to the left and minus means to the right. But there's no stretching or shrinking, so I don't have any number in between the negative and the radical. Mm, okay, we have all of our functions and they're asking us to give them the domain of each. I'm gonna skip this one because I know that this one is not on the final exam. They might ask you to add them, but they won't ask you to do the domains, okay? So I'll just like gloss over the domains. I know what the domains are, but don't worry about that part, okay? If you do have this on the final, they just ask you for the values. So let me write this down. I have f of x equal to seven x plus five and g of x equals two X minus seven. And the first one we have to do is the plus. So let's see, if I'm gonna do F plus G, that means I'm gonna take seven X plus five and I'm gonna add two X minus seven. Since there's no number to multiply and no exponent to apply, I do not need these parentheses but always put them there and then you can decide later if you need them. Here I have to distribute a positive one, which doesn't change these two guys at all. So if I combine my like terms, I actually have nine X and minus two. Sorry about that, nine X minus two. Now the subtraction of it, so F minus G. So now I'm gonna take the F function and I'm gonna subtract the G function. But notice this time, this doesn't have any number or any exponent, so the parentheses can go away. But here I have to distribute the negative one. So I get negative two X and a positive seven. So I end up with five X, plus 12. 
and then to multiply them, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to FOIL. So FG means like F of X times G of X. So then I have to actually FOIL this out. So that's 14 X squared. That's negative 49 X. That's plus 10 X. I don't know why I put that. That does not belong there. And then five times negative seven is negative 35. So if I combine my two X's together, my like terms, I get negative 39 X in the middle. So let's see, 14 X to the two, get down minus 39 X minus 35. And then the last one, that one's pretty easy. You just stick one over the other. So it goes on top, 7x plus 5. And g goes at the bottom, which is 2x minus 7. OK, and that's all we're going to do. We're not going to do the domains of this one. Um, it's not going to for that on the final. They do not ask you about the domains. We've covered it in class, but they're not going to do it on the final, so I'm not going to waste the time. Um, yes, I want to. Okay, this one is interesting. It's a little bit different. So number 14, we have um, f of x equal to 2x minus 1 and h of x equals negative x minus two. And they want us to find f of h of negative seven. Now, many of you, not even just a little bit, of many of you got this problem wrong on the test. Y'all pretended like that was a times and then did it as if it were multiplication. If it were multiplication, there wouldn't be anything in the middle. Look at that one, that one's multiplication. There's nothing in the middle, okay? So it's not a multiplication. That is what they called a composition. And compositions mean you plug one Y value into the other function, okay? So when you rewrite this, it has to stay in this order, but with a bunch of parentheses. So F on the outside, then H, and then negative seven on the very end, okay? And just like orders of operations, you work from the inside out. So you have to figure out what this is first, okay? And if I'm plugging negative seven into H, that means I have negative, negative seven for X minus two, which is a positive seven minus two, which is a five. So now I am just plugging five into my F function. So two times five minus one, which is 10 minus one, which is nine, okay? So you don't plug in negative seven and negative seven and then multiply them together. Nope, nope. You have to plug in the negative seven into H, get that Y value, and then this Y value becomes the X value into the other function, okay? That's what a composition means. So here it should just be nine. Now, I have f of x equal to negative 2 x minus 7 squared plus 8. And so this one's like got a through e. So the first is the domain. The domain of any quadratic is going to be negative infinity to infinity. Always. All quadratics have the same domain. Um, in the range, the range is going to be from negative infinity, right? The y values go all the way down toward negative infinity up until you get to this spot right there, which that y value happens to be. A. So your range is going to be from negative infinity, oops, just one, to eight. I don't know why I can't get that in the box. 
And it actually shouldn't have a parentheses. It should have a bracket because there is a point there at, at um, y value of eight. Then it says the vertex, find the coordinates. I know the y value is eight and it looks like the x value is seven. So it's gonna be parentheses seven comma eight. And then the axis of symmetry is always x equals the x value of your vertex. So it's gonna be seven. A hint right there, right? X, what is the X? The X was seven. The Y intercept is a little bit different. Y intercept is what you get when you plug in zero, okay? What you get when you plug in zero. So if I plug in zero in there, clear, negative two parentheses, zero minus seven squared plus eight, I get negative 90. And it says type an ordered pair. So we plugged in zero for X and we get negative 90. Which makes sense because at zero, it's way down there before this blue line gets to the Y axis, right? Now the X intercepts are a little bit more complicated. So for the X intercepts, I want to say C video because all the other parts I did it in the computer. But for X intercepts, we have to take the whole thing and equal it to zero. So it's like the Y became zero. Okay. And then you solve. So minus the eight over divide by the negative two. Do the square root property, right? It'll go away. The square will go over here, but then you'll have plus or minus the square root of four, which is actually plus or minus two. And then you can add seven to both sides. So two positive two plus seven is nine. Negative two plus seven is going to be five. And so we have two x-intercepts. So nine comma zero and five comma zero. It's like I forgot a parentheses though. There we go. Now this one's pretty much the same thing. Um, they just have an extra bit where we have to figure out where it's increasing and where it's decreasing. Not too big of a deal. Oh, but they did give me the function in a different kind of form, right? It doesn't have the parentheses with the square and all that good stuff. So we'll definitely need to use a formula here. Let me write it down and then we'll try it. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, we should be able to do these two problems before we before we leave. So f of x equals x squared minus 14x plus 45. So the first part says to give them the vertex. So when it's like this, right? Like a quadratic a x squared plus bx plus c, you have to use a formula to find the vertex. The vertex is at a point called hk. And H can be found by doing negative B over 2A. And K can be found by plugging in H into the function, okay? Because K is the Y value, right? So if I want to figure out what H is, I need to do negative B, the negative 14, over 2 times A, which is an invisible 1. So I end up with positive 14 over 2, which is 7. So now I know the X coordinate of the vertex. If I want the K, the Y value of the vertex, I'm gonna plug in seven into my function. I don't know what that is. Um, negative 49 plus 45 should be negative four. So then what is the vertex? Vertex is going to be seven and negative four. 
And I think I did that right. We'll find out right now. Because I did it in my head. I didn't use the calculator. So we'll see. Oh, yay, I did. Um, And then it says, why is it asking me to graph it? That's not what it says for part B. It says, use the tool. I have my vertex. Um, now that I have the vertex, I can plug in seven and negative four, which is right here. If I were to plug in zero for X, I would get 45. So when you plug zero for X, it'd be way up there. That's too far. So I need another number. Um, maybe six. So let's see. Let's get another point on there. Um, is it going to ask for x-intercepts? Let me see. No, it never asked me for x-intercepts. Fine. We're just going to plug in another number. So I'm going to plug in f of 6. Just because I need a second point in order to graph the function. You need the vertex and then another point to graph. So I get 36 minus 14 times 6 plus 45. So I have another point here. Now I should be able to graph it. So let's click, click. And again, on the computer, in the test, the final, it's just multiple choice. You just pick. So 7, negative 4, and then 6, and negative 3. There we go. Let's check it. Now the axis of symmetry is always x equals whatever the x value was of the vertex, which is seven. The domain, we know the domain of any polynomial, right? Is going to be negative infinity to infinity. And we know the range, well, with the picture there, the range is going to be from this y value up to positive infinity. So from negative 4 with the bracket to infinity. And then now the intervals for domain. Notice it says open intervals, which means no brackets, all parentheses. So increasing. Well, if I'm tracing this from left to right, it's going down and then it's going up. So it's going increasing on this right-hand side, and it starts at this x value, which happens to be seven, okay? So it's gonna be parentheses seven, and then all the way to the right, right? And what are the x values going to, to the right? They're going to positive infinity. Now, decreasing would be, was a trace that, it goes down, 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 right? So it'd be all of this left-hand side. So from the X values all the way to the left are negative infinity. And then to this X value, which was seven. Now, I, it's 1.30, but I'm going to finish this last problem just because it's like super fast, and we kind of already done one just like it. All I'm asking you for is the vertex here, and we know a formula to figure out the vertex, right? We have that formula right there. So all I need to do is find H negative B over 2A which is negative 12 over six, which is negative two. There's only one of the answers in there with a negative two X value. But if I wanted to find K, I would just be plugging in the negative two for X. So three negative two squared plus 12, negative two plus seven, I get negative five. So the vertex would have been negative two and negative five. And that one's right there, it's D. 
Okay, so over a minute, but that's okay because a lot of you didn't come in <laughs> until a minute afterward anyway. Now, some of these might go a little bit faster when we come back, but we'll continue where we left off. And if I see any others that I can kind of ignore because I know for sure they won't be on the final, um, we'll do that just to save some time because we still have more to cover, okay? Um, but other than that, if you guys have any questions, you can ask them. If not, um, you guys are free to go. And make sure that you keep improving your my math lab homework as much as possible until Friday. And don't forget to do the extra credit for the survey. Okay. Well, you guys have a good one.